thought I wanted to be a microbiologist and study genetics. Uh, I was looking for a good biology program, but in a small college, I didn't want to go to a big university. Reed had a good reputation. And I very quickly found out that I didn't really like working in a lab and wasn't particularly good at it. I hated organic chemistry. <laughs> um, so I ended up dropping out of school. I worked again. At, that's when I was working at Shakespeare. And then I, I ended up living in Israel for all, and traveling for almost a year. Then I came back and started at, at Columbia. I did, and I, I was an English major. I had no idea what I wanted to do. After that, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. So I, I applied for what was then called the Vista Volunteers. I think it changed its name to AmeriCorps later. It was the domestic version of the Peace Corps, established at the same time as the Peace Corps. I, I considered the Peace Corps, but um, I didn't want I didn't want to spend two years. I'd already delayed college a year and a half. So I ended up working in a literacy agency in upstate New York. And while I was there, I was trying to figure out what it is I want to do with my life. And I decided I had no idea. So I could delay my decision by another three years by going to law school. You say that, but Columbia Law School is no walk in the park. It's not. I actually loved law school. I was nervous about it going in. We come from an era where there was a show called The Paper Chase based on a movie called The Paper Chase about the horrors of law school. So that that was my image of law school. But I found it really intellectually challenging and interesting and actually really enjoyed it, enjoyed the people, the professors. I didn't go in wanting to be a lawyer. I'm not sure I came out wanting to be a lawyer. When you go to a law school like Columbia, you have lots of options which pay well. <laughs> and, and so it's sort of, it's, we called it the golden handcuffs, right? I had to pay off student debt. So I wanted a job that I could do that. And then you just end up on that that slide. Okay. Okay. Now tell me about, I think you were clerking in Philadelphia. Is that right? I did. I clerked in Philadelphia. So back when I applied for clerkships, there was it's a little bit like, I think, getting your residency, like there was a time frame that all the judges agreed to when they would accept and when they would take applications and when they would accept. And like many people, I just spread applications to a whole bunch of judges. But the etiquette was that if you got offered a job, you were expected to take it. And the judge in Philadelphia just happened to be the first judge I interviewed with, and he offered me a job the same day. So I didn't really, I ended all my other <laughs> interviews that were coming up. So that's how I ended up in Philadelphia. But it was a great experience. I went into litigation after that, and there's no better training for a litigator than to, to sit next to a judge and understand how they approach cases and decide cases and, and for, approach the law. For people who don't know what clerking really means when you clerk for a judge, what does that entail? Yes, when a case comes in, a, a litigation, a dispute between two parties, the judge will assign it to one of his or her clerks. And the clerk's job is really to understand both the facts and the laws presented by the parties. And then usually most judges have their clerks draft opinions for them and then work on the opinions with their clerks. So you're doing, you're getting the research from both parties and you're doing your own independent research then you're crafting a, an opinion on who you think is right or wrong, and then you work with the judge to confirm that he or she thinks you're right based on your research, and, and then an opinion will be issued. So most of the opinions you read um, in law books are drafted by law clerks. Um, some judges write more than others. Some probably do very little editing, and some probably rewrite everything their clerks do, but almost all of them have a first draft come from their clerk. Now, what did you take from that experience that, let's say, on a given week, you'll go back to, like an early lesson? It's an interesting question. I, I think in my current life, the lessons are a little bit less relevant because they were very litigation focused. The real value as a litigator is you saw how a judge approached both the law and the facts and where the judge exercised. Judges are really interesting. And they're the last vestige of sort of a fiefdom, right? It's, it's the last place where there's an individual who has almost complete and total authority over people. 
and there are obviously checks and balances on that. There's appeals courts, and if you're unhappy with what the judge is doing, there's ways to address it. But for the most part, you're at the mercy of the judge while you're in front of the judge. So it's really interesting to understand how a judge exercises that authority, which is is largely unlike anyone else's authority in any other position in the country, and what does and doesn't work in catching their interest for, on behalf of the client. So I, I think those were the most valuable lessons as a litigator. More generally, what I took away from my clerkship was the attention to detail that my judge had. I, mm-hmm. I don't think you become a lawyer without a degree of attention to detail, but we hammered home how important it was to understand everything that you were making decisions about and how important the details were, the small things were, because people noticed them if you got them wrong. Even if they didn't impact the outcome, it cast doubt on how you got there. You were at a firm for a while and then you ended up coming to Sumitomo. I think that was 2006. And I actually got to Sumitomo just a year later. So you've pretty much seen 15, 16, 17 years now of how Sumitomo works, how corporate counsel in a corporation works. What was the learning curve when you got here as to not just corporate law and how that differs from working, say, at a firm, but working with the Japanese corporation specifically? Yeah. So I guess uh, let me take that in two parts. The practice of law here is very different than the practice in a law firm. And one of the most significant ways in which it's different is that you're juggling a lot more, but a lot smaller. As a senior litigation associate in a law firm, I had maybe 10 matters at any given time, five of which were active and one or two of which were really active. Um, But they took all my time. When you come into an in-house job, you may get 10, 15 requests in a day with short turnaround times, which once you're done with it, it's done and you don't have to go back to it, but you're that's coming every day. So you're not thinking big picture, how am I managing this one thing long term? You're thinking, how can I get each of these done as well as having some things that are, are longer term as well? So I think just in terms of managing work, that was a big difference um, for me. Uh, obviously, the the kinds of law I was doing were different as well. Um, I, I wasn't a contract lawyer at the law firm. I did contracts like settlements and, and things like that, but it wasn't the focus of my practice. I mostly wrote uh, motions and took depositions and reviewed documents, most of which I don't do here at all. So there was a learning curve there as well. But I think the litig- as a litigator, contracts from the point of view of when they've broken or not worked. So I, I, I think that's actually there's a significant value to that. And it helped me as a contract attorney. And the it, it was a very small department. It's still a pretty small department, but people work closely together and there was a lot of support. It was easy to go to people and say, I don't understand this. What should I be doing here? There was also formal resources as well as continuing learning groups that I would go to to take classes on various things that I felt I needed to to bulk up on. So it, it was definitely a, a significant change from the law firm in, in a lot of ways. With respect to the Japanese culture, there are obvious frustrations with understanding how decisions get made and why they do or don't get made and why they sometimes take so long. But uh, one thing that I've really liked about working at Sumitomo is I think the legal department is respected. I like the consensus building aspects of the culture and appreciate that people listen to what we have to say and take it seriously. And some of that is just Sumitomo specific culture. I think some of it is probably Japanese inflected, but that's been that's made it a pleasant place to work for as a lawyer. Now, I, over the years, you've also obviously worked with uh, Japanese lawyers who <clears throat> come to this from different cultural position in even learning the law and learning the differences between Japanese and American law. 
in not so much the nuts and bolts of how it works or how it's codified or anything like that. Is there a, a philosophical idea that is similar and one that is different when it comes to a law in the United States and law in Japan that seems to be coming up consistently when you're working? Um, the answer is no, uh, in part because Western concepts of laws have probably infiltrated Japan pretty heavily oh. in, in two ways. First, <clears throat> Japan organized its initial set of laws and diet after German law. And then after World War II, the U.S. occupation actually forced certain rules and laws. And in the law, gen in contract law generally, um, for better or worse, Western and particularly American and English standards of contracting have become the worldwide standard. So even when they're applying slightly different legal frameworks, contracts tend to look the same from place to place. That said, historically in Japan, contracts between parties were not at all like American contracts. And we still encounter that. Sumitomo in Japan may have a long running relationship with a supplier that goes back 80 years, and they'll operate that supply agreement on the basis of a single Japanese paragraph that says something like, loosely translated, we agree to be parties with each other and work fairly together. And that's the sum total of their contract. I, that's become less common, I think, but it still exists and it sometimes raises issues when we have disputes with goods here that were supplied by someone in Japan under that kind of condition and what rights do we have against them or what rights do we want to exercise against them become an issue. I think there is that sort of philosophical difference that things were not historically spelled out in Japanese contracting relationships. They were more handshakes and understandings and, and the formality would be very minimal. Okay. Um, uh, but I, I will say for the Japanese lawyers that come to the U.S., um, I think all of them were either got additional training in the U.K. or in America um, and are admitted as lawyers in either the U.K. or in some U.S. jurisdictions. So they all have training as as lawyers in, in jurisdictions like the U.K. or the United States. Speaking of the U.K., I wanted to talk a little bit about you becoming a barrister solicitor sorry yeah. well, sorry. <laughs> um, how did that come about exactly i was i like international i like international transactions and i was honestly hoping that if i had that qualification it would increase my ability to to do more of that kind of work didn't really work out that way but i look i Candidly, I was I wanted a little additional challenge. I was a little bored, and you know, it was a way to challenge myself. And the company was willing to support me, so why not? And I have an affinity for England. My father worked there a lot, so I traveled there a lot when I was younger. And yeah, so it was just a great opportunity. I, in retrospect, it was a lot of work and very stressful. I'm not sure I. If I'd known at the beginning what I knew by the end, I'm not sure I would have done it, but but I, overall, I'm glad I did it. What do you need to learn to become a solicitor? So at the time, and they keep changing the rules on how, to, how they do this. At the time, you had to be an admitted lawyer in a different jurisdiction. You had to have English proficiency, which I didn't, despite being American, they didn't require me to prove my English proficiency. Um, but if you're coming from like a, a European country, you have to take a test. Then you have to take a general knowledge test of English law. So the first thing you have to do is study English law, I think, in in 10 areas of law, like contract, criminal law, wills, real estate, conveyances, things like that. Then you take a general, it was a multiple choice question over three hours. If you pass that, you then have to go to England and take a what was effectively oral exams over three days both practical and oral. So things like you would be assigned a deed that you had to draft. And so you'd have to draft a deed in like a certain amount of time and turn it in. You would be given a client who you had to interview and then write a client memo on what laws applied to their case and how you would uh, approach it. You had to answer 
questions before a panel. So it, it was a pretty much more rigorous than the US bar and pretty stressful. Hmm. But okay. I it, they've changed it. If I'd done it five years earlier, I literally would have had to sign a form saying that I read English law and that's all I would have had to done now would have automatically be admitted. So the, the rules keep changing. At this point, what is your responsibility as CLO and what does a typical day look like for you now? As the chief legal officer, I sit with the other CXOs. So uh, I have some responsibility for discussing overall strategic issues of the administration of the company, both in North and South America. So I, I need to have some interest and insight into how can we do things better, where are things not working, what's our long-term goals as a company, and how can I help get us there? So that's big picture. Day-to-day, -day, I'm managing a legal staff of 13 people in the U.S. and have some responsibility for the staff in South America, where there are three lawyers and an, and an administrator. So just understanding what they're doing and providing support to the work they're doing and making sure that work is somewhat equitably divided among them and people are getting opportunities to expand their portfolio, but also leveraging their strengths, normal HR management kind of stuff. Doing my own, I still do legal work for clients. So that's a part of every day. And then working on larger projects for the legal department, like the implementation of a contract lifecycle management system, which we're going to be rolling out hopefully next month. What now? What is that exactly? We're going to ask um, everyone to start submitting requests to the legal department through an online portal that will track all our work and also provide some self-service options for the business users. For instance, if they want a confidentiality agreement, they don't. They won't necessarily have to ask a lawyer to draft it. They'll be able to answer a few questions in the portal, and it will generate a contract that they can send directly to their counterparty. And if the counterparty doesn't make any changes, the lawyer will never see it. And it will automatically go into a repository and be tracked by the system. If they or the counterparty want some customization, then it would come to a lawyer for help during that process. But ultimately, we'll have workflows set up for multiple types of contracts that will streamline the process and speed the, the turnaround time. I think one thing I like about Sumitomo and the reason that I've stayed here and probably risen here is because I, I think Sumitomo, which is flawed like any other company, but I, I think it genuinely believes in its principles and they align with mine. And, and I really appreciate that. And I appreciate that other people in the company give more than lip service. To their principles they try to live them i'd like to think that that's one of my big truths